Welcome to Boone's Ferry. My name is Matis. I've um, been team teaching through the Proverbs this summer, so I've had more Sundays off than I normally do and feel very rested and excited to be back here. And today will actually be the last Sunday in the Proverbs. But before I get into the future sermon series and um, what you can expect, I just want to give a couple short announcements. We have our welcome cards. I see lots of new people. Uh, We'd love to hear from you and any uh, contact information you're interested in giving us, we won't abuse it. We we just use it to um, be able to contact you and let you know about the goings on in the church, but also it's a way to fold people into fellowship. We want people to feel like they're part of the family really quickly once they come and uh, want to be part of Boone's Ferry. It's also a way for us to give you more information if you'd like to. So If you're brand new and it's your first time getting a welcome card and you turn them into the connection table after the service, we'll give you um, gift cards. I think it's to Dutch Brothers, so that's worth it. And uh, love to to hear you. I like Dutch Brothers. I don't know about you guys. Um, Another thing I want to announce right now, because I tend to forget after the sermon, especially if the sermons go long and I'm rushing to get it done, uh, out of respect for your time, um, someone said there's a thin red line between prison and a long sermon. (laughs) <laughs> you can't really leave, you know, people are going to judge you for it. <clears throat> so I'm aware of that. Uh, but today we have corporate communion. If you're new to our church, three Sundays out of the month, we have communion free form. We're still doing it the same time together, um, but it's whenever you feel prompted to go to communion tables to your left, your right, and behind you. But when we have corporate communion, Um, I get down from the pulpit, we sing a couple songs, during that time you gather your communion, and then you can come back, I'll be back up here and I'll lead us all to do it simultaneously. So that's what corporate communion means, and that's what we're doing today. Um, when When I forget to say that, there's no way to tell the congregation again, because people are already up here leading worship, so I thought I'd say it. Um, I don't have any other, um, important announcements, but, um, I do want to, um, I do want to talk a little bit about the, uh, the study in Genesis. So we're not starting immediately in September, and that's for two reasons. One is a spiritual reason, and one is a practical reason, and they're both weighty in my mind. The spiritual reason is that we like to remind people in a two-part sermon at the beginning of September of what our mission is and how we intend to carry it out. Um, no two early September mission sermons have ever really quite been the same. They will have some repetitive content for those of you who have heard it before, Um, but I have found that when it comes to the mission, it's not just about people knowing it, but it's actually about people being able to tell other people, which is sort of a second level of knowledge and usually for me requires repeating. I need to hear things multiple times before I'm able to actually use them to influence others. So um, those are important sermons. Whether you're able to be here or not, which is actually the practical reason, usually people are trying to squeeze last couple vacations out of that early September, late August time. And so sometimes you won't be here for those sermons. And that's why I'd rather not start uh, Genesis until it's sort of the the average person is settling into the school time and kind of coming back. For some of you, that's not even until October. Sometimes we get late times. But I think you're not going to want to miss the especially opening parts of Genesis. We don't go through Genesis 1, which is unique in all of the book of Genesis, more than once, just one sermon. And uh, I think it's really powerful. This isn't going to be... Sunday school walk through Genesis. Genesis is wild and real and rough and intense and times hilarious too. Um, But it's just, uh, I heard one theologian said that uh, the marriages of the patriarchs are one of the greatest reasons to stay married and not get divorced. And I was like, what? Those marriages were so messed up. And the guy goes, those marriages were so messed up and they never got divorced. So, (laughs) and they, they really well. Abraham gave Sarah to two different kings. And then his son did the same thing once. So there's just, and Jacob was kind of the worst of the lot, so to speak. And um, so one thing we're going to be discussing, well, it's it's three things, but they're all together. It's creation, the fall, and how God redeems that. Uh, The creation narrative is relatively short, and so is the fall. And everything after that is redemption history. And redemption history is rough too. It starts with a flood where God just wipes everyone out, but Noah and his family. And then after that, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, there's just so much brokenness and so much sin, and it doesn't really look like God's redemption is working until you get to Joseph, who had the worst life, unarguably, out of all of them, got sold into slavery. It wasn't his fault that his father favored him more than all the other kids, but that made them murderously jealous, but they decided not to kill him, sell him to slavery. He goes... 
uh, to Egypt, and then because he's just a stand-up guy, trusting God's sovereignty, um, becomes the head household slave or servant of Potiphar, which just means you're like you're higher than other people that aren't even servants when you're the the highest servant in somebody some dignitary's um, court, and then. Uh, I say he gets me too, you know, false rape allegations. And then the next thing, you know, he's in prison and he's in prison for a long time. Long enough for a guy who he supernaturally interpreted his dream to, to forget that he did it. So he's enslaved, falsely accused, falsely imprisoned, and now he's in prison for a long time, but he just keeps trusting God's sovereignty. All the other patriarchs decide to take things into their own hands. There's no example of Joseph actually doing that. And what happens? That same guy remembers him, tells about him to the Pharaoh. The Pharaoh brings him across, uh, uh, up, he interprets his dream, and next thing you know, Joseph is the viceroy of Egypt. And his sons or his brothers come, and he tests them to see if they're really repentant, and it turns out that Judah is actually going to sacrifice himself so that Benjamin, the only other son of Jacob and Rachel, will, um, will not have to go because he said it would kill my father. And Joseph can't even handle it. He's in tears because he's seeing these, these brothers of his have changed and they have this unbelievable reunion and there's this famous line, which I think is kind of maybe the most important line in all of Genesis, uh, which is that you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good and for the saving of many lives. So if you're wondering whether God can redeem your life, sometimes it takes a long time. Sometimes if you're looking at the short game, it feels like things are getting more messed up, not better. But Genesis is one of the most powerful ancient foundations of truth that even though God created everything good and that it was messed up through human sin and needed redemption, and even when redemption seems to be coming a long time, it does come and God's arm is not too short to redeem anything in your life. It's a powerful message. It's going to be a good time together. It's going to take us at least two years. It's 50 chapters. We'd have to be racing through it to go any faster than that, and I think two years is even fast. We'd have to cut things together that didn't really even feel like they should perfectly be together. So we're looking forward to that. We want to invite all of you to that. And I don't want to take any more time to get into our last sermon on the Proverbs, which we call the way of kings. Wisdom really is the way of kings. So if you want to know the way of kings, way of kings and queens, listen up. This is our uh, last major deep dive on wisdom for the summer. Not till next year when we get back into the Proverbs. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and its power. You spoke light into existence by your word. You just said, let there be light, and there was light. And it's because of that great power that we fear you, and when we fear you, we can receive your wisdom. And so I pray, Lord, that today, although there are so many different themes and not a clear main point, uh, that people would still feel like they have are listening from an anchored position where they understand uh, what's being said and aren't lost in the many switches of themes and topics. I pray especially that the main point, that our words have spiritual power for good or for bad or for evil, um, is, is something that we need to know and, and we need to have a heightened remembrance and, and awareness of just how powerful our words actually are. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you get your Bible, go ahead and open up to Proverbs chapter 15. And I said this last time I preached that uh, by watching Steve preach one of the Proverbs, we've been trying different ways to preach the Proverbs. They, it's a very much more difficult genre to preach than what's called prose, like New Testament prose, maybe Romans or the, the prison epistles or First and Second Timothy, where one point leads to the next and it makes sense. So you choose a chunk where you can see a main point and then you show people that main point and then you apply it. That's what a three-point sermon is called and it, uh, I've gotten used to that, but Proverbs is a, I wouldn't say loosely related, but not, not obviously clearly related collection of wisdom sayings. You'll have two wisdom sayings right next to each other that don't really have much to do with each other at all. So it's very difficult to develop a three-point sermon. I have developed what I think will probably be the way that I go through the Proverbs from now on by going with themes. And I've got those slides, so if we want to go through those slides quick just to show people. I've organized, I've taken them not in order, so we're not going 1 through 33. We're going to skip over verses that don't have the same theme. The main theme that I'm picking out for today, which also led to that main point I just prayed about, is the power of the tongue. 
And you'll see that verse 15, 1, 2, 4, 7, 14, 23, and 26, and 28, uh, probably the largest theme within it, are about the power of the tongue, the power of your words. We have another theme right after that, um, which is receiving or rejecting correction. All these Proverbs, 5, 10, 12, 21, 31, 32, 33, they're all about receiving or rejecting correction and its consequences. So I'm not going to go through all those slides, but we have about eight or so some only have one or two verses in them, like about prayer, it's 15, 8, and 29. Um, but if you're wanting to know, like, how, how, how do I listen to the sermon, listen to it by themes. We'll go through those themes, and then we'll come back and go through the next theme until we're done with every single verse. And <clears throat> another thing I'm learning about preaching the Proverbs is that uh, many of the themes get repeated. So um, it's not necessary that we focus on the power of the tongue over and against the uh, receiving or rejection correction because that's also about the same amount of verses. But the last sermon I preached, I talked a lot about receiving and rejecting correction. So I'm going to weight it heavier, just a choice, on the power of the tongue. Um, so I hope that makes sense. I hope that helps you to listen and pay attention. Uh, there may be one or two topics that hit home very specifically, and it's okay to think about those more than the others. That is, uh, I think, the way that Proverbs is designed is that you would receive wisdom for what you actually need right now. And not every single verse is about what you actually need right now. There may be a situation in your life where you need a specific verse for that. So hope that makes sense, and that's what we're going to do right now. We're going to start with verse 1, the power of the tongue. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Before I get into the content of that verse, I just want to talk about the power of words. Um, I knew this before studying it, but I, I don't think I knew it as deeply as I know it now. Uh, it's like on the tip of my mind, and I don't think I'll ever lose it again. And it's the idea that our words have spiritual power. You know the saying, sticks and stones. But, you know, if, if your friend got angry at you and intentionally broke your arm, um, it would probably break the relationship, you know. Even if they apologize, you're like, I don't, you know, your anger is way too intense. You just assaulted me. And even if you don't... Um, have them charged with anything, it's, it's serious. Bodily harm is serious. I'm, so I'm not trying to put down bodily harm at all. Um, but a broken arm doesn't necessarily break your spirit. You know, you could break your arm and it not have affect your spirit at all. But words can affect the spirit. We'll actually see that set, uh, being said in the Proverbs specifically. But an, an amazing example of this, I shouldn't say amazing, a somewhat tragic example of this, is in the negative version of it, because they can affect the spirit positively or negatively. And I have a friend, and he's a good friend of mine, I'm just gonna keep this whole story anonymous, but um, his dad told him, you're a knucklehead and you'll never amount to anything. And he said it over and over and over again. And I'm not a computer programmer, but we have, uh, I've got lots of good friends in this church that are, and I think about it in terms of code writing. When a father speaks to his son that way, it's like writing a code on his hard drive, on his spirit. And so for his entire life, he is trying to prove that he is not a knucklehead and that he will amount to something. And he's highly intelligent, and he's amounted to something over and over again, but he never really feels like he has because of how powerful those forming early words were on his spirit. So that would be one example. Of, and you know this. When, you, when your parents, the things that you say to your children, they are so powerful, and they form their spirit. I don't think we need to take too much weight on ourselves. It could crush us because God's grace is there for our kids too. None of them will ever have perfect parents. And so it's, it's about forgiveness and confessing that and leaning into God's grace for transformation in your, in your word life. But the same thing is true for powerful encouragement. I, there have been times where I am like seasonally discouraged and it is not easy to help rebuild a church in the first place. That's what I was called and hired to do here at Boone's Ferry to, um, to help rebuild some of the things that have kind of uh, slowly begun to, to fall apart. And that's not easy work. People disagree with the changes you make, and then there's relational strife, and people leave, and it's all, all very painful. But if you're, if you're excited about it, that's contagious. But if you are disappointed or discouraged about other things or about how that's going, it's hard to get up in the pulpit every single day. Nobody wants to hear a discourage pastor talk about things and sometimes the passage about consider it all joy and I don't feel like considering it all joy at that moment I'm discouraged so 
you, you have to rely on the Spirit of God to help your emotions match the tone of whatever you're saying or whatever's needed for leadership. It take, takes tempering. It's very difficult. You have to be like an emotional vessel to some degree and let God decide what you should be feeling. And he can. And he doesn't force it, but he's powerful enough to, you know, actually change your heart in moments when you're discouraged. And you know how he sometimes do, does that? Through encouraging words of those around you, through encouraging words of Christians. And so you're really actually discouraged because something really actually discouraging is happening in your life. And someone says something encouraging into that. And although the situation has not changed, you're all of a sudden encouraged and not as discouraged. It's spiritual. It's real. And it's, it's magnified by the Spirit's work in our life. It's not magical. It's supernatural. And it's very real. So our words have the power to build the spirit up and they have the power to tear it down altogether. And yet I think even in great and healthy churches, we still, I say we, I even do it, my, I somehow rank my thoughts and my word sins as less than my action sins. Does that make sense? Well, I said it, but I didn't mean it. I still sin, you know? It required Jesus to die for every one of the sins that I speak or think, and by the way, biblically, all of the things that you say come from out of the heart. And it's not talking about your heart of flesh. It's talking about the center of your being. It's, part, it's partly your mind. It's also where your, your spirit and your, your emotions, what you deeply care about, flow from. And if that's poisoned, your words will be poisoned. So this is... This can be a virtuous circle or a vicious circle. If your parents spoke poisonous words to you and you feel poisonous about yourself, you will speak poisonously to other people. So what do you do? You have to have your hard, wire, your hard drive rewired. You have to have new code written on your heart and that is what God's word can do. No other words can do that. God's word can do that. So I, I don't even think I'm belaboring the point too much. Words are so powerful. They're so powerfully destructive and they can be so powerfully life-giving and upbuilding. So one of those proofs is chapter 15, verse one, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. You know it's true because you've experienced it. You ever approach someone harshly, you're coming in hot and they're just so nice and you're like, I can't come in hot again, you know? <laughs> Because, like, that's the opposite. You were, you know, usually when I'm coming in hot, I'm probably looking for a fight a little bit. I want them to come in hot right back, you know, and then, like, hash it out. But, which is not a good way to relate to people. I'm not in any way saying that's okay. But we do it. We all do it. We get hungry, angry, lonely, tired, and we come in hot at times. And so the person that's speaking the soft answer is doing so under the duress of your wrath, so to speak. It says wrath here. But any degree of anger or harshness or hard words coming at you, uh, it's not just someone speaking soft to you in peacetime. They're speaking soft to you um, while you're coming at them with wrath. That's the whole point. A soft answer turns away wrath. The wrath was already there. So it can be very difficult to speak a soft answer into wrath. In fact, I would say what, the, um, what, what Solomon is talking about here is impossible apart from the spirit. Uh, the actual kind of softness that turns away wrath has to be real. It can't just be a practice thing that you do to manage people's emotions. You ever feel managed by someone? They've memorized all the phrases to say. You know, uh, sometimes when, when hiring and firing managers do that, they've memorized all the ways to make it sound the most positive possible. And no matter how angry you get, they're ready for that with phrases. And you feel managed. You feel emotionally managed. This is not that. This is a genuinely loving, soft answer in the face of a relatively mean, wrathful statement or attitude. And so you ought to recognize that the call here is for soft answers under duress. It's not just soft answers at any time. It's not always, always be nice about everything. It's about returning evil with good. And I want to, there's probably more than these two ways that we undermine ourselves from ever being able to do this. But these two ways are both related to pride uh, one of them we don't usually think of related to pride, but I think it is. And it's insecurity and arrogance. Let's start with arrogance. If you think too highly of yourself and someone gives you a dose of reality, and maybe they do it a little harshly, maybe they do it wrathfully, you're not going to feel like speaking a soft word back to that. You, it's the how dare you speak to me that way. And to whatever degree that pride exists there, I think we all have that little how dare you monster in us, you know. 
especially if we're caught out guard. How can you, how can you speak to me that way? And you mean like you don't deserve to be spoken that way compared to other people who maybe do, you know? And so that kind of pride, that kind of arrogance will not really, it takes humility. It takes a sober estimation of who you actually are. It takes not being super easily offended by anything someone says because this wrath is gonna be offensive. Uh, have you, you know, isn't it uncanny how people that really know you and love you know exactly what to say that pushes just the right buttons? You know? So do you feel like speaking a soft word when one of those buttons has been pressed? Well, what if you just actually had God help you get rid of that button? Some of those buttons are like, you better not say this thing about me because I know I'm better than that. That's kind of in the arrogance category. In the almost exact upside down or inverse category is insecurity, which is also a form of pride. People don't think of it that way, but what insecurity really is is trusting our own words and the words of others about ourselves more than God's words. If you just trusted God's words, you would not be insecure. The, the uh, antidote to insecurity is faith and trust, humble faith and trust in what God says about you. He sees all of the bad stuff. And unlike whatever parent that called you a knucklehead and said you wouldn't amount to anything, he loves you all the same and he'll never speak a contemptuous word uh, to you or about you. In fact, I'll say this to you. Um, I cannot remember a single time that my father or mother said anything that was contemptuous to me. Never happened. They've been angry at me. They've spoken to me angrily. But contempt is when there's that, that seething hate for the person. And you're trying to cut them down. You're wanting to say something mean. And so you say it. Never once can I remember a time that happened. If they were here, they might say, well, yeah, we probably did. But I don't remember it. I had amazing parents in that way. And so I, I want to say, because of that, I don't really understand what it's like to have parents that were contemptuous, mocking, vicious, poisonous with their words towards you. I can't imagine how hard that must be. I don't even pretend to, to know. Uh, it makes it harder for me to even empathize with it, except that by the Spirit I can, because I see the way some people behave both in arrogance, which I think oftentimes is a response to um, having the wrong kind of words on your, your, written on your hard drive, um, but also insecurity is another thing like that. When it, I don't feel like overarchingly insecure. I feel like because of the way my parents talk to me, I feel like I'm valuable and like I, I'm, I'm worth something and I have a purpose and there's not something uniquely wrong with me. And then when I hear, yes, there actually is something uniquely wrong, well, not uniquely, you're all, all sinners, there's something terribly wrong with you and you, you can't get out of it without the forgiveness of God. I don't feel diminished by that, but rather it's like an open doorway to like, God, God knows all those things about me and he loves me anyway, you know? That doesn't mean I'm not insecure about things. Uh, my buttons can be pressed as well. So if you really want to have soft answers, you need to identify the areas where maybe you're prideful about yourself and your character and your abilities and areas, or you need to identify the areas that you're insecure and let God either humble you or secure you in those areas. Otherwise, you're always gonna be sort of 50-50 or maybe even less, like 70-30 on being able to give a soft answer in these situations. This is part of what it means to grow in self-control is to know, to use a modern word, what your triggers are and to break them, to get rid of them by the Spirit. So it really is such a powerful thing and it's a wonderful thing within the congregation when the average person will speak softly to someone that's angry at them. I can't tell you, there's, by the way, the Bible says be angry but do not sin. So someone be, may be very legitimately angry and not sinning at all. And if you can speak softly to them, it's like uh, <laughs> seen Avengers where, um, what's her face? The Black Widow like speaks softly to Hulk and he stops being the Hulk. That works in real life. How many times has someone taken your anger seriously but not responded with anger and it helps, it's like the anger is just leaking out into wherever but not in you anymore, right? So it's such a powerful thing and that's why I'm spending so much time on this. If you really wanna learn how to speak a soft answer in the face of wrath, you gotta drop those puffy notions about who you are and you also have to drop the false notions about who you are that are, um, what we call insecurities. 
Very next verse, chapter, two, uh, uh, chapter five, uh, 15, verse 2. The tongue of the wise commends knowledge, but the mouths of fools pour out folly. I want to spend less time on this one because I think it's a little more straightforward, but I do want to address one area where sometimes Christians get a little bit foolish about what they're willing to commend and what they're not willing to commend, and it's the area of doctrine. And I don't even mean bad or good doctrine. I mean the idea that sometimes we adopt as Christians that doctrine isn't really all that important. Like it's just our actions and whether we're going to be kind and love one another that's important, but doctrine's not that important. First thing you need to know about that is that doctrine just means teaching. And all biblical teaching is teaching about who Jesus is and what he has done and how that relates to us. So if someone says, well, it's just about loving people, doctrine's not that important. Well, you wouldn't know that it's all just about loving people except for doctrine teaching that. And not every church keeps love first because there are other doctrines that somehow get stacked on top of it. And yet Paul says (coughs) that um, even if you give yourself to be burned in the fire, but you have not love, you're nothing. You're like a noisy gong. It's annoying and it's, it's harsh and it's not good. So the truth not in the service of love is not a good thing. Um, we'll talk more about that a little bit later. But we ought to think very highly about doctrine. Uh, that doesn't mean we have to constantly be studying the most difficult and wordy scholarship there exists, but we ought to be thinking about growing in our understanding of biblical teaching doctrinally. If I say, the doctrine of justification. It'd be a good thing for you to know what that is. We're not going to spend a bunch of time on that. But it's different than the doctrine of sanctification or mortification or glorification. And yet you probably know in every one of those categories, sanctification, becoming more like Jesus. Justification, being accepted in the first place, being made righteous vicariously through the cross by faith. Mortification, the death of your sin. Glorification is someday you becoming exactly like Jesus. All things we really care about, but they're just these awesome words that contain so much information, freighted words of doctrine. So a a wise person will commend doctrinal studies to others and not say, oh, that's not important. Now, not everybody has the same gifts that allows them to delve into doctrine the same way. For example, some of your gifts are more service-oriented. That might be one of the reasons why you feel so strongly about service, and that's a good thing. But all good service flows out of good doctrine. Anytime a church gets off denominationally or something weird's happening, it's always some, you go back to the, the headstream of that and it's a bad doctrine of some kind. You know, like you have to speak in tongues to be a Christian or uh, you can't wear jeans as a woman or these, these legalisms or, or sometimes it's also like anti-holiness where uh, legalism has been reacted to and so now no rules really matter, which is also not biblical. So... Um, doctrine matters and wise people commend people for that doctrine. Verse 14, gentle tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. I think this is a similar theme as verse one. Um, And so I'm not gonna talk as much about a gentle tongue being a tree of life as much as I'm going to talk about the idea of perverseness. Because the first one was anger and harsh words, which are not necessarily perverse. When we think of perverseness, I think we oftentimes think of it in like a, with like a, a sexual grid over it. This word, uh, word doesn't necessarily require that. It, could, it just means like crookedness, twisted, perverse. And that's really what perverse means even when it's applied to uh, the area of romance. And I use words like romance because um, I see kids in the congregation. I'm just trying to keep, keep it PG-13. But you know what I mean when I say romance um, or when I say sexuality. Um, so I want to talk about that a little bit. And I want to let you in like as if you guys were listening in on an elder conversation about a very important thing. Um, and it was a while because this, this relates to how perverseness breaks the spirit. Then we're talking about a gentle tongue. So the perverseness that we're talking about is spoken perverseness. There's spoken perverseness that breaks the spirit. Remember I said your words can actually harm people's spirits? Well, we were talking about that uh, when it comes to public schools. And I brought this up a couple of times, but we're right on the cusp of starting school again. And so I thought I would offer this, especially for parents who are con- still maybe considering what kind of schooling they want to put their kids to, um, but also for anyone just to be aware of what's actually going along. Um, it's not an overstatement or an exaggeration to say that perverse teaching is legally required in Oregon for children. You just look it up yourself, you will be shocked and you will not think that what I said was too extreme or too radical. If you look up on like OregonEducation.gov and look at their curriculum for comprehensive health, their curriculum for comprehensive health, their goals for what they want children to retain are all perverse. And like like, turned up to 11, 
You know, the kinds of words that they want memorized and understood and being able to be defined in kindergarten. All sexual words. And not just sexual words about, like, what I would call normal moral expressions of romance, but uh, even very deeply twisted ones that adults should not be thinking about or discussing with other people. We ought to... Uh, shun that kind of thing and not even it shouldn't be found in our speech that's what Ephesians says um, so what we were discussing what I was bringing up to the elders and and this wasn't just me like teaching them we were really discussing it from our own understanding and I went to public school and I went to public school I graduated from high school in 2002 so that kind of gives you an understanding of my generation and back then the big things were um, whether children are going to be taught about abstinence or condoms in health class, that was a big one. And then in science, uh, were they going to present creationism um, or only evolution? And the evolution, the idea like we've, we come from primates, we're not created by God, we're not made in some kind of spiritual image, but we're just the result of millions of years of, uh, of, of death and the um, mutations that come from that, that uh, through survival of the fittest, this animal slowly became sentient. And uh, so I thought about that and I thought, you know, First of all, back then, they offered, they offered abstinence-level health, so you could just opt out of the other one that presents more than parents wanted their kids to hear. And the other side of it was me hearing from someone who's not a Christian that they don't believe that God created the world is not inherently harmful to my spirit as a kid. If you are too impressionable, it could become harmful. Um, it's not as helpful as someone teaching me about creation. I am so glad that our kids are actually being taught about creation in their school. Um, but I basically thought through and the, the, the elders all agreed. It's like, yeah, back then the normal thing to say would be, you know, parents, it's by the way, it's always your choice what you do. Uh, we don't have the authority to, authority to guide, uh, to teach, yes, but to tell you what to do with your parents or with your children and then you have to do it. Not the kind of authority that elders are, are given. Um, it's ultimately just God's word that's the authority there. And, and that, I think, establishes clear lines of authority. You as a father and a mother, you're in charge of what you want to do with your, with your children. So don't, don't uh, think that this is uh, way too prescriptive in that way. But what the elders realize is that what's being taught in school these days is no longer like it used to be, where it's not necessarily inherently harmful. When perverse uh, speech is uttered, it breaks the spirit. Children are not prepared for understanding these kinds of concepts that early. And especially when they're twisted, it twists their spirit in a way, it, it malforms them. It's like similar to like giving a baby a large drink of whiskey. You don't do it. You know that can actually damage them permanently. It wouldn't necessarily damage an adult man permanently. You'd have to do it way too much and, and it, way too frequently, but with a little kid, like that's a fetal alcohol syndrome can happen from that, especially in the womb. And that's how we all realize we feel about these things being taught to children. And so I think you ought to be very careful. It's not legal in Oregon for the, for the teachers to not teach this. So they're teaching it. They're not not teaching it. You might get the occasional Christian person who is shrewdly you know, bobbing and weaving through having to teach it. Um, but I think that the things that public schools are teaching these days are inherently harmful to children, and it's not something you can undo at home once they've heard it, once they're being introduced to it, once they're being peer pressured to believe it, and as though that's the right thing to believe and you're a good person only if you believe it. It's not the kind of environment you want kids in. And don't say to yourself, well, my school's not doing it. It's illegal not to. Look it up on Oregon education. Now, I won't take any more time on that, but that would be an example of how perverse speech, especially when it's magnified and weaponized in like the romance area, the sexual area, um, can really damage children. But it's also true for when you just shade the truth a little bit to the side that leads people to believe something that's not quite true, right? That might just not be as damaging to the spirit, but when someone constantly does that, uh, do, you, do you trust them more? Do you, don't you start like lowering your respect for their words because you never really know if they're just shading in their favor or not and gaming you or manipulating you? So we ought not to think just like the worst expressions out there of perverseness. It's in us as well. And it's because, again, it's not neutral. You're being tempted to have something crooked to say because you're trying to manipulate an outcome. And so watch yourselves when it comes to that. Verse 14, still on the power of the tongue. The heart of him who has understanding seeks knowledge, but the mouths of fools feed on folly. And so you might think, well, this uh, is not necessarily 
Um, actually, I think we want to go to verse 7 first, so I'll, I'll talk about 14 in a minute. The lips of the wise spread knowledge, not so the hearts of fools. I'm going to combine verse 14 with that. Uh, the heart of him who has understanding seeks knowledge, but the mouths of fools feed on folly. Um, so when it talks about the mouths of fools feeding on folly, it's not talking about the, the, their diet, like they eat wrong stuff. It's the idea that they, with their speech and through the speech of others, are gaining an appetite for foolish things. This happens. It's, it, foolish things appeal to your flesh. They do. There's a reason why there's so many unbelievably foolish uh, reality TV shows out there. There's a market for them. You know, somebody's watching. Somebody's getting all those advertisements from those things into their minds. And the content is just so terrible. You know, so honestly, I think that way about The Bachelor. So if you're offended, uh, then... Um, what did we say earlier about not being too easily offended? Uh, but uh, it's like, yeah, you really want uh, a situation where um, a woman or man is being pursued by like 50 people simultaneously kissing this one, kissing that, doing this, doing that. You know, it's not a godly way to date, and, uh, but it's so romantic, so people get drawn in. I think it's foolish. I think it's foolishness. It's not the kind of entertainment we ought to be putting in our minds. And I could pick on uh, lots of other kind of shows too. That's literally just the one that came to mind in the moment. But uh, you ought to be developing a appetite for wisdom. And it's not what you will naturally desire. It's a desire desire that grows uh, like a virtuous circle by receiving more wisdom in the first place. It's not something you can even have to begin with if you don't fear the Lord, but if you do fear the Lord, that doesn't mean that you won't be in certain seasons maybe developing your hunger for foolish content, and uh, we ought not to be doing that. Verse 23, to make an apt answer is a joy to a man, and a word in season, how good it is. You ever said something like just right and just the right moment, and you just... You know, that was, yeah. And, uh, you know, jokes aside, um, it really is, if you're wondering, we're going to talk about another category about joy and um, its benefits. And uh, this is one way to have more joy in your life, is to be prepared to give an apt answer. And it doesn't always necessarily mean there was a question, but you're, you're saying something, you're speaking a word in season. You're saying something that was needed at that moment. It was good and right. You have friends like this. You might be this person. Where does that come from? Spiritually, it comes from having the word of Christ dwell in you richly, which doesn't happen by binge eating God's word uh, every once in a while. It happens by just regularly being in God's word. If you've been reading through the Proverbs in the summer, there's going to be times where you're coming up with God's answer to a situation and God's word's answer to a situation. And so it, it brings joy to you. It's a source of joy. You're wondering, where does joy come? This is one place it comes from, God's word being spoken in season by you. It rejoices the heart. So that might be a cool thing to start trying to do is to, it's not so much like looking for every opportunity to have the right answer, but start ingesting God's word. All the right answers are right there. Verse 26, the thoughts of, so we're almost done here with the power of the tongue, which is the, by far the largest section in this sermon. Verse 26 says this, the thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord, but, the gracious, but gracious words are pure. Instead of when we looked at public schools, we were like, oh, those pe bad people out there, which ought not to be our attitude. The idea is protect your kids and protect their minds and their spirits in this idea and make sure that whatever they're being taught um, is what you actually want them to be taught. So be very vigilant on this. And instead of this time talking outwardly about those people, let's look at it inwardly. Um, the thoughts of the wicked are abomination. So uh, just because we're righteous and saved does not mean you don't sometimes have evil thoughts. You know, I'm amazed at times how, how quickly I can get lost in like a one or two minute sort of revenge fantasy and how good it feels. I wouldn't be doing it if I wasn't enjoyable. How many times is like an Old Testament revenge sort of like wrath of God movie sell well? Pretty sure all of Clint Eastwood's movies are that, you know, and uh and there's something about that that we, that we like. We like these revenge stories, and we sometimes think about how you could get a revenge. And even if you wouldn't do it, that's an abomination to the Lord. He hates it. He hates those crooked thoughts. He really, that's who he is. You can't get around that. Um, but he loves these gracious words. And there's a purity to gracious words. Um, gracious words don't come from a crooked thought life. They come from a pure thought life. So if you have a person that is regularly speaking gracious words into your life, 
it's not like you can see their heart like Jesus does, but through this kind of wisdom, you start getting a picture of what kind of heart that is. There's a purity there. They're not thinking duplicitous thoughts about you, saying nice things here, thinking mean things about you then. You know? And you should be thinking about your own heart. How pure is it when it comes to your thought life? I think most Christians probably think, if they think of some kind of hierarchy of how bad sins are, actions are the worst, words are second, and thoughts are not even really that big of a deal. They are a big deal to God. They're a very big deal. Uh, last verse, verse 28. Uh, says this, the heart of the righteous ponders how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours out evil things. So I want to um, use two modern words, introversion and extroversion, to explain what I've learned about the idea of thinking and talking. And I think this is really interesting and it's part of the reason why I'm going to talk about it, but I think it'll also be helpful. I'm an extrovert. We have lots of introverts. We have some introverts leading our discipleship communities. Um, and it's a challenge for both introverts and extroverts to be good Bible study discussion leaders. It actually is. And I want to talk to you a little bit about why. If you're a good discussion leader, you're allowing space for protected, safe, and guided discovery of Scripture. So you're not jumping down people's throats, but you're also not talking too much. If this is a Costco pizza, uh, which is cheap and still very good, uh, you're taking just one slice of the pie and waiting, make sure everyone else gets a slice. But as extroverts, we can easily take way too many slices of the pie, and that doesn't leave enough space for other people to, to verbalize their thoughts about Scripture, which is a really powerful way to grow. In the same way, with introverts, sometimes they don't verbalize what they ought to be verbalizing to the groups in a leadership level, as much as they should. And I can't tell, all, some of my very closest friends are introverts and they'll sometimes say, well, I feel like I've been talking too much. And everyone in the group laughs, like not even close, you know? So you've got these two different approaches, the same, we all, both extroverts and introverts are coming to the same proverb in verse 28, which says, the heart of the righteous ponders how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours out evil things. So the initial thought is, oh, well, introverts are probably better at that. And that is my experience, that introverts are more likely to actually think before they speak. But there's an interesting thing that I've found, not maybe in most extroverts, but a lot of extroverts are verbal processors. I'm a verbal processor. It means that I'm thinking about what I'm trying to make my mind up about by talking about it. That means some of those sentences are not what my final thought about it is going to be. Uh, introverts only very rarely do that. It's they're thinking, they've worked that out in their mind before they speak. And that's actually a really good quality. It's a very good quality to have. And I think it's important for both extroverts and introverts to learn how to be competent, if you're an introvert, in extroversion and vice versa. Um, so I want to give some advice. If you are an introvert, and I've heard the introverts I'm thinking of actually say this, don't say to yourself, someone else has already said it, so I don't need to say it. There are plenty of verses in uh, the Psalms that talk about, I will praise you in the midst of the congregation. And it's this idea that each man and each woman ought to be doing that with their voice. So one example of worship is like, we're all saying the same words. So that same thing would apply. It's like, well, then I don't have to say it. No, it's good for you to do so. When introverts and extroverts alike agree and say something out loud. So someone says, you know, I think prayer is really powerful. And then you think, oh, that's what I was about to say, but now I don't need to say it anymore. No, say it anyway. I agree. Prayer is really powerful. A unity is developed, an adept of unity, the power of, of unity when you hear a lot of people agreeing verbally together. So um, extroverts don't even think this way. Someone else said it, so I'm, not, I'm gonna say my thing, you know, even though it's the exact same thing. And so that can sometimes be annoying. The point is your words matter. This, this, this verse actually says that. The heart of the righteous ponders how to answer. It doesn't just ponder, it answers after pondering. So sometimes... One of the most valuable things introverts can do is, to some degree, extrovert themselves. It takes a lot of energy for introverts, oftentimes tired after that. But you're the ones that are naturally thinking deeply about these things. Say them out loud. Don't keep them to yourselves. And uh, realize that more often than not, you probably think you've said too much and nobody else around you thinks that. Um, again, with, with extroverts, it's almost the exact opposite. One of the most powerful things an extrovert can do in spiritual conversations with people is listen actively and ask questions. 
Because it's not difficult for you to talk. It's not difficult for you to extrovert yourself. Pour that energy into asking questions about people. I uh, have never been very good at this, but I'm growing in it. And I'm finding that as a pastor, one of the most interesting things to do is just to keep asking questions about people's vocation. Um, it's almost like a how it's made uh, of vocation. You just get this insight. So how does that work with you know, those chips at Intel? And how does that work with this thing? And so what do you actually do on a day-to-day -day basis? And how do you overcome that challenge? Uh, if you're really interested in persons, it's not that difficult to do. So maybe another thing, if you are a verbal processor, A, get yourself someone that will listen to you and that helps you process and do that before you go into a significant conversation. Another thing is every extrovert can realize that they can also <laughs> ponder a conversation in their hearts and verbally process all by themselves in their minds, you know? That might be the most obvious thing ever to an, to an introvert, but to extroverts, it's a challenge. You have to actually have a conversation in your head about that idea with yourself. You're not crazy. Introverts have been doing it for years. It's what the Bible says you should do. Ponder it. Well, I don't think that'd be a good idea because this and this and that, you know. You can verbally process all by yourself. So those are my piece of advice for things I've learned coming from the extroverted side. Um, I hope I was balanced in that way. But we want to hear what you have to say if you're a more quiet person. And we want you to hear what we have to say if you're a person who talks more too. And so when you're interested, it really draws people out. All right, we're done with the power of the tongue. Hopefully that was very helpful to you. And uh, it was very helpful to me. Moving on to receiving and rejecting correction. There's just as many verses. It's still not going to get as much play because we've gone over it so many times in the, uh, in the Proverbs already. I do want to say that um, it starts with fearing the Lord as well. People who do not fear the Lord are not ultimately spiritually correctable. All correction that sanctifies you, makes you more like Jesus, all correction like that is spiritual. Therefore, it is very deep. The things that people are saying were oftentimes things that you find sort of core identifying markers of yourself. And someone saying something that sounds like that core of identifying marker is not good. The spirit in you, it's the deepest place who you are. That's what needs correction at times. So it's always going to be deep and it's always going to be difficult. And so you have to think about whether or not you fear the Lord enough to receive correction. David feared the Lord to the degree that an enemy could correct him. And he would say things like, well, maybe this is the Lord speaking, even though this person is obviously not right in the way they're saying it. Maybe this is God's way of getting a hold of something in me that I wasn't gonna listen to from anybody else. God does speak to us through enemies at times. So correction ought not to just be uh, received only from the people who love you most, but sometimes the most necessary correction, the people that love you are either failing or not sure how to tell you. Um, and that's maybe another thing about correction, the flip side of that. Uh, if no one's ever giving correction, no one's ever receiving correction. So we need to be a congregation that is willing to be corrected, but also willing to correct. On the willing to correct side, this is the preamble for these verses, and then we'll work through the verses. On the willing to to correct side, I would say this. I hear basically two reasons not to do it. One, it's not gonna go well, and two, I'm worried it's gonna harm the relationship, okay? And I'm not saying those are always illegitimate, but I will say about the first one, you literally never actually know how it's going to go when the Spirit of God is involved. Things that seem like absolutely impossible to you are possible with God. So you might think, I'm, I'm not going to go and correct this person who clearly needs correction because there is no chance that they're going to listen. And then God's spirit works on them. Maybe not the very first time they hear it, but he works on them. You've planted this seed of correction and they're finally starting to listen because the spirit of God has opened them up to it. So there is no point in pretending like we are uh, prophets who can see the future and know. On top of it, I think that reason is faulty because it doesn't matter what the, the result is uh, in terms of your responsibility. You're not the result giver, the spirit is. The spirit's the one that can take a spiritual correction and apply it to someone else's spirit. You can't do that. You can speak the words in love and that's it. You can be used by the spirit. So it's not your responsibility to predict or even cause the right in outcome. It's your responsibility to speak the truth in love. Regarding the relationship side, I will say that um, in my 15 years of being a pastor and the rest of the years, you know, witnessing my parents' ministry. So 
most of my life has been really close to full-time Christian ministry. And uh, it's like nine out of 10 times of correcting people that it harms the relationship. And sometimes that relationship breaks. I don't know what statistic I would apply that, but more often than not, it goes bad. And that's, that's true whether, it's true even more if you added some kind of harshness or legalism into it, or there's something wrong with you the way you're saying it, you're being hypocritical and it's like the log and the speck kind of thing. But even when you are being uh, truly loving and surrendered to the Spirit, I would still say more often than not, initially at least, it goes poorly and there is a distance in the relationship. And what I've learned over time is that you need to love the person more than you love your relationship to them. Okay? You need to love the person more than you love your relationship to them. This might be a close friend who you love hanging out with. You don't have a lot of those. They're encouraging and it's really great and you don't want to mess with it. But you see something that needs to be corrected. If you love them more than you love the relationship, you're going to be willing to risk having some distance and difficulty in the relationship for a time. So that's all I want to say before we actually go into the Verses a fool, verse five, a fool despises his father's instruction, but whoever heeds reproof is prudent. I would say this is obviously literally to children. So for those of you in the congregation that are at that stage of your life, there's going to be times that your parents tell you something that you are certain is wrong and maybe even dumb. And I would say again, nine out of 10 times, maybe 10 out of 10 times, you don't even understand half of it and are not capable of evaluating. I'm saying that because I told myself I was gonna remember what it's like to be a child and how adults sometimes tra- teach, uh, or um, uh, how adults sometimes uh, uh, re- uh, react to children. So for example, as a young kid, I knew that what I was doing was wrong, but didn't really have that big of a consequence in the grand scheme of things. For example, I was told not to use a, um, uh, a little, I don't know if you guys have ever seen those, um, they look like nutcrackers, but you put incense in them and then they like, the incense comes out of their mouth, or out of a pipe or something like that. It was one of those incense things and I loved the smell of it and I was not allowed to light it by myself. I lit it by myself, burnt my hand, tipped it off, burned a hole in the carpet. My mom sat me down and said, Matisse, I know that you burned the hole in the carpet. And the kind of criminal mind I had is, I wanna know how she knew. How did you know? <laughs> you know it's the only kid in the room. Um, I wanted to make sure that I could do it without any being caught next time. <laughs> and this is just me remembering from her telling me. So I don't know, I don't know what else happened in that moment. But um, I think about stories like that and I think about how I thought I knew better than my parents uh, in that I could. And, you know, these carpets, they're nylon. Uh, they can catch on fire. They can catch the furniture on fire. They could burn the whole house down. Someone could get killed. It was so much bigger of a deal than I realized at that time. What the time I was thinking is that you're making such a big deal about a little hole in the carpet. We're not even going to remember this when we move to America like you're talking about. You know, literally thinking you're putting like the fear of God in me and it's just a hole in a carpet. To them, it wasn't just a hole in a carpet. It represented endangering the entire household with fire. So kids, you don't know all the things you're going to know as you get older. You know, I now sometimes make a bigger deal out of things and my kids don't quite understand. And I do that because I know I want them to stop doing that because of the consequence that it could bring later on. And so they're probably feeling exactly like I am. Adults always make everything so scary. You know, it's not that big of a deal. I think Ezra's probably the only one that thinks that way. But uh, if you have a kid that thinks that way, um, one of the most powerful things you can do is to not have the fight always be between your authority and their will, but transfer it to God. Show them what God says about this because he's perfect and they can never find out he's a hypocrite. They can find you're a hypocrite. Oh, you said don't say this. Daddy, don't say stupid because I told them not to say stupid. And then I found out God says stupid in his word. So <laughs> man, we, we went over that. Um, so you want to you wanna put the weight on God's word in this case. Okay, no more about verse five. Uh, Verse 10 says this. There is severe discipline for for him who forsakes the way. Whoever hates reproof will die. This is one of the few Proverbs that's actually about eternal destinies. Um, The severe discipline for him who forsakes the way and whoever hates reproof will die. We're talking about eternal trajectories. And since verse 11 actually talks about hell and destruction, I'm going to leave more conversation about that. But one thing I will say about this is that um, 
People do this all the time. You watch people slowly sort of forsaking the church, forsaking prayer, forsaking any kind of Bible study, and the next thing they do are like they're doubting whether the whole thing is real altogether. And I think the same thing about willingness to correct in that case. You know that someone's trajectory who's walking away from the Lord, a stray sheep, um, it may be a salvation issue for them. And so it's worth at that moment telling them, hey, I see these signs of you kind of walking away. What's going on? Don't just say, I'll do it someday. I'll do it someday. Love them enough because the consequences are eternal and so severe. Verse, 20, uh, verse 12, a scoffer does not like to be reproved. He will not go, uh, not go to the wise. In other words, he's not going to approach the wise person. How do you know? Because they scoff. You have people on the internet that like, it seems like a whole generation of people that are just scoffers. They're always mocking something they find foolish. It turns out they themselves won't even go to the wise to find out what's actually right. They don't know themselves. Um, their scoffing is like an hypocrisy, really. And I think that's helpful to know, uh, especially if you are working at a job where you have to deal with people like that or where you're seeing that on the internet. If someone's just constantly scoffing at something, they don't really have anything to say other than negativity, and it's, uh, it's a good thing to avoid. Verse 22, without counsel, plans fail, but many advisors, with many advisors, they succeed. Out of all the verses about rejecting or accepting correction, I think this one might be the most important one. Uh, for us is, uh, do you have people that are advisors in your life? People that you trust to give you godly advice. And then on top of it, are you pure in your heart when you seek advice? Because it's easy to sort of figure out who's going to say what in general and then go to that person because they're more likely to give you uh, a way out, like a soft answer on something that you actually need to be held accountable for. Or they're more likely not to really kind of see through the whole issue and to say, yeah, I think it's fine. Um, I think one of the reasons you go to, to more than one counselor is that you're going to get wisdom from like a 360 degree angle from a lot of different people. I did this when I was first wanting to start date Christ, dating Christine. Every single relationship before that with a woman had led me farther away from God because of my own desire. And so I just broke it off with her. And then I went to like five or six counselors, including my mom, who had said no to every girlfriend I ever brought home before I even brought them home. And I told her about this. She goes, yeah, maybe seminary is a good time to date. She hadn't even met her. She knew my heart and how I was relating to the issue was I was willing to give it up. There's no longer an idol for me, relationships like this. And so I was just floored and felt like that seemed like a very clear answer that it would be okay to move forward. And it was only about a year after that that we were married. So it has, advisors can change people's lives dramatically. You might want to think of being an advisor for someone like that and do you have, like, it takes effort to seek advisors like this. Uh, one group of advisors that it takes almost no effort to seek is the elders, and I do it myself. I involve the elders um, even in decisions like financial decisions. Do you think it would be okay to take a loan to be able to get this while my children are still young? Here's my finances. What do you think? I ask them questions like that. Um, and I, I, I actually kind of expect God to speak through them, and, and he does. So we're available to you. I was going to say any time, but what it means like we're very available to. Church is not so large that we can't meet with just about any person or any family to discuss these kinds of things with, and we can be advisors in that way. And like I said, I've experienced the power of that myself. Uh, 31, almost done with the two major categories. The ear that listens to life-giving reproof will dwell among the wise. And I'm just going to read the, the rest of the 32 and 33 too. Whoever ignores instructions despises himself, but he who listens to reproof gains intelligence. The fear of the Lord is instruction, wisdom, and humility comes before honor. So listening to reproof is life-giving. It leads to intelligence, and it's a function of the fear of the Lord. Moving on to our next God's economics. I'm going to read all of these verses and just make a couple comments about them. Verse 6. In the house of the righteous there is much treasure, but trouble befalls the income of the wicked. Verse 16. Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble with it. Verse 17. Better is dinner of herbs, or herbs, depending on how you say it. Not even sure which one I think is right. Where love is than a fattened ox and hatred with it. Uh, so better just like a meager dinner and have some love than the best food ever, but there's a bunch of contempt. Uh, verse 25 says, the Lord tears down the house of the proud, but maintains the widow's boundaries. Verse 27, whoever is greedy for unjust gain troubles his own household, but he who hates bribes will live. The main thing that I want to tell you about um, 
God's economy is that it doesn't work like math works. You pursue God righteously and you're going to find yourself taken care of in ways that, that don't always make perfect sense. Where did that money come from? I mean, literally, if you, it's, it's not actually breaking the rules of math, but it's, it's a spiritual reality that if you're right in a relationship to God and pursuing the things that he wants, he promises you he's going to take care of your needs. Seek first the righteousness of God and his kingdom, uh, and, and all these things will be added to you. It's a promise that when you're on mission, you're going to have what you need. Uh, God is benevolent, and so... It, you look around, it's like, well, that person has plenty, and they're not pursuing God, but there's still a special relationship. Um, I can just tell you, when I was living for myself, I got almost no financial help from people. Now that I'm living for God, it's unbelievable how much help I've gotten. Would have never been, about, been able to buy my house if I didn't. So um, I look at my life, and I think because God changed it and has given me a spirit to pursue him, he's also blessed me for it. Kind of feels like God high-fiving himself, and I'm caught up in it, but that's what it is. God's economics are not the same economics of the world. And so that is something you can only trust by faith. Because giving money mathematically means you have less of it. And yet God says the very opposite of that. Give and you will receive. So um, oftentimes some of the very wealthiest Christians are also the biggest donors and givers. Because they understand that principle that it's not intelligence. It's, not, it's, it's faith, it's wisdom to understand how God works. I want to talk about prayer here too, verse 8 and 29. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is acceptable to him. Verse 29 says, the Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. Um, this is not mostly a sermon about prayer, um, but I do want to say this. Not all prayer is acceptable to God. I'm pretty sure these days the, the common and sort of popular thing to say is that God always hears you and God always is listening. There are things you can be doing and patterns of destructive behavior that you can be exhibiting in your life that completely limit your prayer life altogether. He's not listening. He's not listening to Don Corleone when he goes to confession. You know what I mean? It's, that's what I thought about the very first time. It's like a uh, you know, Catholic mob boss who murdering somebody on Wednesday and then still coming to church on Sunday and, uh, or mass, I guess guess, and um, it's that kind of thing. But um, even something for husbands as uh, not small, but less destructive than a mob boss, living with your wife in a non-understanding way will hinder your prayers. We're told to live with our wives in an understanding way so that our prayers may not be hindered. Our prayers can be hindered. It might be that some of your prayers are hindered because there's something you haven't relinquished. And uh, I don't know what that is, and I don't think we need to delve into it, but I thought that'd be a valuable point to see from Scripture. God sees everything, kind of a scary reality, but true, the, verse three, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. I will say this, for those who sort of have a temptation to fall into actual conspiracy theories and that's taking too much time up in your life, it might help to know that God actually knows all of the machinations and everything good and evil that's actually happening. And you don't. You can theorize, uh, you can feel like you see a lot of evidence, but you can trust God to know what the evil things are and to thwart the ones that he wants to and to uh, bring to light the things that have been done that are wrong. Verse nine, the way of the wicked is abomination to the Lord. I, I've read that one already. It just fits in both. Um, verse 11, Sheol and Abaddon lie open before the Lord. How much more the hearts of the children of man. Sheol and Abaddon, uh, Sheol is, what is like the place of the dead, what we would call hell. Abaddon is destruction. That's what those uh, uh, Hebrew word means. So hell and destruction lie open before the Lord. He can see them. They're not closed to him. We cannot see them, right? I, I don't know if this is the perfectly right way to think of it. They're other dimensional. They're in a spiritual dimension that's not here on earth. You can't go find hell. You can't go find uh, Abaddon, the destruction, but they're real and God sees them. And um, so if he can see things like that, the depths of hell, how much more the hearts of the children of man. And when I was first writing this, I thought, well, they know this already, but I, it just might be just the right thing for someone to hear. God knows exactly what's going on in your heart good or bad. You know, there's no point in hiding it. I think Christians sort of sometimes like put like an avatar out there as like kind of like a mask of who they want to be perceived as. God already knows who you actually are, you know? So if you're going to be real with God, you might as well be real with other people. 
this is uh, sort of off the script, but it just came to me. If you want deep relationships, you have to be real with people. Other than just relating to your avatar or whatever image that you're projecting. If you can't have a relationship with an image someone's projecting. You can, it's not very deep. It's as shallow as that image is. So the more real you can be, the more you can be who you truly actually are. That doesn't mean giving into your flesh, but it means being honest with people and, and open. If you're seeking deeper relationships, the first thing you should do is live in a more um, unafraid way, being your real self. God sees it anyway, you know? So, yeah, I think the, the deepest relationships come from people who understand that uh, God sees everything in your heart to begin with and loves you. Um, God sees everything. I've already done verse 11. Uh, the right or wrong path. Verse 19, the way of the sluggard is like a hedge of thorns, the, but the path of the upright is a level highway. I'm going to continue reading 21 here. Folly is a joy to him who lacks sense, but a man of understanding walks straight ahead. And verse 24, the path of life leads upward for prudent that he may turn away from Sheol beneath. Uh, spend the least amount of time on 24 because we already talked about it, but... Um, it's, it's worth realizing that uh, foolishness can be really fun. It can be really, uh, fools, it's a joy to them to be foolish. So you know that when you're doing something foolish, it disguises itself as something fun. And uh, that, happens, that happens way too often. So if you're having a whole lot of fun, but you're thinking this may not be wise, you're probably being foolish, okay? Be aware of that. Benefits of a joyful heart. Man, I wish we had more time. We're out of time, so I've got I've to go through this. Verse 13, uh, the glad heart makes a cheerful face, but the sorrow of a heart, uh, of, excuse me, but by sorrow of heart, the spirit is crushed. Verse 15, all the days of the afflicted are evil, but the cheerful of heart has a continual feast. Verse 20, a wise man or a wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish man despises his mother. Verse 30, the light of the eyes rejoices the heart and good news refreshes the bones. By the way, that says uh, in Hebrew actually makes the bones fat. So if I call you fat boned, I just mean you're a joyful person, okay? <laughs> Probably shouldn't do that. People might take it the wrong way. But it means, it, that's what it means, refreshes. One thing I want to say about this that I was really thinking about and learning as I went through what rejoices the heart is that... Um, a joyful heart can make bad situations good. And a heart that, that is what are the, the discontent, the opposite of joyful, bitter, can make good situations bad. So, and this is so apparent in my children where everything they're doing, this is like an amazing day they're having, but they focus on this one thing that they didn't get. And it's like the whole day has been the worst day ever. Attitude is a small thing that makes a huge difference. And it doesn't make any sense to have a good attitude about something bad that's happening. It's a spiritual thing that happens in your heart. The Holy Spirit is not susceptible to the roller coaster of different, his joy is just constant. It's a fruit of the Spirit. Let it grow and be that kind of person that actually, um, has joy in their heart even in difficult circumstances, and it just won't be as bad. You make situations worse by letting your heart be overwhelmed uh, by, by everything that's not good and joyful. So again, that joy in the heart is a function of the Spirit. Um, hopefully, some of those themes helped you. I'm going to close in prayer here, and since I announced it before, I'll announce it again. I'll be back up here after two songs to lead us in communion. Heavenly Father, we know that your wisdom is something that is ultimately reflected most powerfully in the cross. It's what Greeks and Jews and every person on, human, uh, on a human level uh, thought was utter foolishness and a stumbling block. But to you, it's the wisdom and the power of God. And so I pray that as we go to communion today, we would recognize that wisdom is not just a matter of amassing knowledge, but it begins at a place of receiving the fear of the Lord, it means what Ben said about obedience, but it also just means actually knowing how truly powerful you are, how you see everything in us, how what you see in us is oftentimes abominable, and yet you still love us enough to send your son to die for us and trade his righteousness for ours. And Lord, that is ev that, that's the reason we fear you. And I pray that we would come with that heart to communion. In Jesus' name, amen.